Uh, right, okay, so quite a focused test about quite a narrow range of topics. Some of the topics we did right towards the end. Okay, so the image and sound. But the main takeout from the whole test was technical language. That was my main problem. There's lots of um, stuff and those sorts of words that was used when there are technical words. And we've got to nail the technical words down. Okay. Um, so that if you're given a question about any particular topic, you always should say, right, you know what, I'm talking about this. Put the technical word down, then talk about it. I'm going to talk about this technical thing. This is what I'm going to talk about. Not... What a lot of you are doing is just like going, you going around in circles, rambling on, and actually there was no, especially on some of those later questions, there was there's some interesting answers. Right, so that first question, that's, I'm going to go through all of them, but that first question, the old true and false game. Statements. They're testing you understand things. Most people did really good on this. The only thing that I will say is, you must answer the question. I think I put this down as one of the gotchas. Um, yeah, making sure that your answer matches the question. It said, tick in a single row. One in each row. Somebody did this. I can't remember what class it was now. But someone ticked, and then th they put a cross in the other one. But actually, it was worse than that. Yeah, the, the problem is if you do that, you're giving the exam examiner the chance to say, well, they haven't followed the instruction. Don't mark it at all. Quick. Quick to mark. But actually, it was more like that. So it was like, have I crossed through the tick or not? So, whoa. Do what you've been asked. So a single tick for that. So that's a, a simple thing to rectify. Okay? So yeah, that was, that was quite an easy, nice. I quite like those sort of questions because they're quick to answer. They're easy to mark. There's no like, guesswork involved. Um, right, question two. Benefits of dual core processor over a single core processor. You can't just make... I've walked out a camera shot there. That's what I do all the time. Uh, I'm always doing it. Oh, I'll fall over or something. I've done that before. Um, I don't care if I move the code. It doesn't bother me. Uh, right, for this, they're asking you to say, right, what is that technical thing? If we've got two processors, that means we can execute two things at once. Okay? With a single processor, you can only execute one thing. But it isn't just a, oh, we've got two processors, that makes everything faster. It can only help if your tasks can be split so that they run at the same time. If you're multitasking, Remember, that's the switching quickly between more than one program that's loaded. If you've got more than one processor, obviously, that's going to improve your multitasking speed. Because you've actually got dedicated processors that could halve the load. So if you've got multiple programs that you're in, you're streaming something, you're doing some word processing, you're researching something at the same time, then a multi-core processor is going to help with that. It doesn't give you more clock speed. In general, multi-core processors run slower than single-core processors. So you can't like start talking about clock speed. But you can talk about being able to execute simultaneously instructions. Because you've got multiple cores. All right? But it's about the task. So you have to talk in this about, yeah, what that's going to do. That is going to allow me to have multiple tasks running at the same time. Or, if you've got a program that can take advantage of multiple processors, that's obviously going to speed up. So like video processing games, games now, games didn't used to be able to take advantage, but they now they start being built, dedicated for multiple processors. Okay, so it, it wasn't just enough to say, yeah, it's got more, some people were waffling on about clock speeds and things, but it, you've got to make the technical points. You've got to, so they're testing that you understand multitasking. That's what they're asking you about. Do you understand multitasking? Do you understand about being able to split a task up across more than one task? So it's like, to do this job, uh, this program needs to do X, Y, and Z. Well, X and Y can happen at the same time. So if I've got two processors, 
those two will take less time overall. Okay. Is that, yeah? So do you have a green pen? I have a green pen. Okay, right, okay, so not, there was only a couple of marks for that. So it, it was state the technical thing, explain how that is possible then. That was the key. Um, right, the next one, this was an interesting question because it was ridiculously easy. The answer was just to say, well, that one's got more cores. But if you just said computer one has four cores, which some people did, compared to what? They're asking you to read some data, aren't they? And they could ask lots of different formats for that question, but they've given you some tabular data and said, compare. Narrow question, very narrow question, but it's asked you to compare. And you, you look at it, you think, well, it's got a slower clock to be, so why is it faster? Well, it's got more cores. That's all they wanted on that one. But you had to make reference to the information you had. So if I was answering this question, I would have said, well, obviously, computer one, it might be going slower, but it's got four cores, whereas computer two's only got two. So on balance, if you've got, I wouldn't have written all this, but on balance, I'm just giving you more depth. In balance, if you've got a set of programs that are taking advantage of as many cores as you've got, then computer one is going to be generally perceived to be faster. <coughs> okay. If you're word processing, that's not a very good way of working out how fast your computer is going because you're never going to be using much CPU. You want some intensive. Probably one of the most intensive things, and if you've ever looked at computer book, uh, benchmarking stuff, they do Cinebench, which is like video conversion, where all you're doing is you're chucking loads of maths at your CPU. In fact, it's so mathematically intensive that you generally get graphics card support. So the graphics cards are great at the maths involved. All right, when you're doing video codec changing, so you're converting from one video format to another. So you generally get graphics card support for that. Okay, and that makes it incredible because graphics cards are just massively parallel CPUs, especially CPUs. But you've got thousands of them on a, on a fancy graphics card. Okay, so that that was an important one to just make sure you reference the information you've got when you answer that question. Right, the next one. Oh, embedded systems. Embedded systems. They don't want you to know much about embedded systems, but they want you to use the technical words. A lot of people kept saying about operating systems. I do not know why. So no, an operating system inside a washing machine. No, no, it's not that. It is a computer system inside a device. That's all you've got to say. No, don't. No, 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 no. It isn't just a CPU, a computer system. Remember, computer systems is the, the major component. Memory, a CPU, bit of storage. It is a computer system that you have to talk about inside a device. You can then give an example. Washing machine. Well, the, the context was sat nav, wasn't it? You must, the key bit is you say it's inside a device. In this case, the satellite navigation system has a computer system inside. You, that's the key word, inside. A lot of people go around, so you just need, some of these are just basic definitions that you need to get down. Right, the next question. Some people answered this quite well. There was a lot of kibosh on this question. Right, it said two differences. So that's two major points you're going to make. And in order to do differences, you've got to show the one side and the other side, whatever that is. On the mark scheme, it was pretty specific with this. So a lot of people went, oh yeah, vol the volatile, non-volatile stuff. Yes, excellent. That is an obvious difference between RAM and ROM. If you get them the right way around, which is number one, the thing you've got to do. Remember, RAM is volatile. Volatile means you forget, you've got no power. But quite a few people, I actually got fed up of marking this and going, oh, I'm going to do it again. But RAM is volatile, ROM is not. Now you can't say that. If you're going to use technical language correctly, you say, RAM is volatile, 
Rom is non-volatile. And that was the difference between getting one mark and two marks. What a few people did... Right, I'll go on about other ones in a minute. But what a few people also did on this, uh, they put Ram is volatile on the first bit, and then the second difference bit, they put Rom is non-volatile. And my job done. And it's like, no, that was only two marks, you blanks. He said that in the mark scheme as well, from the examiner's report, it was loads of students did that. Ah. So you throw away two marks. Right, so the other things you could say, there were things, there was, there's two of the major things. You can say, RAM is for working programs and data, and then the, the difference there is ROM is for the boot program, generally, on a computer. So that was another pair of differences. And then the other one, which was answered really badly, you can only read ROM, it's read only, okay? RAM is therefore not read only, so it's read write. Try and use the right technical words. You can read and write to RAM, you can only read from ROM. Some people were saying that um, ROM's not attached to the CPU. Well, that's, the, the BIOS wouldn't work if it wasn't. Okay, so think logically about that. Uh, a few other people were saying like, you can overwrite, you can't overwrite. So you start, you start getting to wishy-washy words. Try and use read-write and read-only. Yeah, but it's just been about accurate with technical words. If you look at that examiner's report I gave you for that big, bigger question, was saying about use of technical words. It's important, it's your core thing, to nail down your technical words. Okay? Yeah, so there was there was a, quite a few four markers on that, but the, there was a few people were throwing away the mark because they didn't put the other difference down. They just left it as an assumption. Okay, the next question. Uh, pretty universally panned by the marker, i.e. me. <laughs> Why would upgrading a RAM improve the performance? Right, so a few of you said things like, um, oh, you'd have more temporary memory, so you could hold more programs. Excellent, yeah, you can, that's one mark. But why does that improve the performance? Because you're not relying on virtual memory as much. Remember virtual memory. Virtual memory is where we have like, well, not an infinite, but we have extra RAM that we store on the hard disk, but the CPU can't access the hard disk, remember? So if we have got portions of programs in virtual memory on the hard disk, they have to be loaded into the main memory. If there was no space in main memory, something has to go and be saved on the hard disk. That's how virtual memory works. We call it a swap drive, because you're constantly swapping the things you need for the CPU in and out of memory. They can't all fit in there. That's why it's called virtual memory. But if you increase the amount of physical memory you've got in your computer, you won't need to do as much swapping. And what you'll see is a benefit as the computer will speed up. It is the number one thing you can do for your computer to speed it up. The second question is the one that was, what are the other things we can do then? So they've specifically said... And George, stop swinging on your chair, try and make a noise. It won't pick it up on the camera anyway. All right. Right, so the other things we could upgrade, that was what the next question was about. But this is, this is such an important thing. Read the question. It, it talked about the RAM. So don't talk about the RAM. Some people did. I, I can see why. You got down to the bottom and you went, oh, I'm desperate. I can't think of anything else. Ram. Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> All right, so if, it, yeah, if you're desperate, <coughs> chance it. But don't do it as your opening gambit. Okay? Right, so the obvious things. There are two massively obvious things you can do to speed up a computer. Change the CPU. If you change the CPU, you've got to explain what you're going to change. Increase the cores to improve multitasking. All right, so you, you can't just put bullet points. You have to explain. Okay, so that's one thing. The other thing with the CPU, if it's got more cache, and some people started hinting at this, if it's got more cache, that will improve performance. So if you switch out a CPU that's got one meg of cache 
with a CPU that's got four meg of cache, you will get dramatic speed improvements. Because cache is so much quicker to act quicker, he says. My voice going off funny. It's so much quicker to access than normal RAM. Even though RAM is fast, cache is a lot quicker. Okay? So that, that's the CPU side. So you could have made a couple of good points on that. It's no good to say, oh yeah, just put a bigger CPU. You've got to explain it. You've got to explain it. You would have got like one mark for saying upgrade the CPU. But that's as far as you were going to get. You was never going to get three, four, five, six marks. Right, the other obvious thing you can do. Put an SSD in the machine. Now, this is, is a dramatic improvement. Hard disks are mechanical. They... They sl they slowly, I say slowly, they go about 7,500 revolutions a minute. You won't want to put your hand near one that's open. Is it SSDs? SSDs, yeah. Yeah. So, in my, in my answer, you know the one of these marks for increased cash size? I wrote yeah. that and I didn't get a mark for it. How many marks did you get overall? Two. And that was the max because you didn't put enough explanations. That's how the marking bands work. It's, oh, yeah. it's quite cruel. You can actually make lots of relevant points, but if you haven't explained them, oh, yeah. they, they cap you. That's what we've got to work on. Okay. Yeah, so quite a, few, quite a few people got two marks. Nobody got out of the middle band. There was no, like, great, perfect answer to that. But that's what we've got to work on. Um, yeah, so with the um, SSD, because it's not mechanical, you get massive speed of transfer improvements okay the other thing about hard disk is because it's mechanical and it's spinning round and you've got heads that move in and out to access the data there's a waiting time a latency you have to wait for the head even though it, it's not that in human terms it's not a long time you have to wait for the data to be under the head so it can be read or written with SSD SSD works a little bit like RAM, it's random access. You can access any location, doesn't matter where it is, the speed is consistent and constant. So you get a massive update in speed. That and RAM are the two massive things you can do. So you, you needed to have explained about that, okay? Um, the other thing you could improve, but you had to give it a context, was to say, change the graphics card. But you had to say why you're changing the graphics card. Just because you put a fancy graphics card in a machine does not speed the machine up. It depends what you're doing on it. So you would need to say, like, yeah, if you're playing games or any other graphical uh, or mathematically intensive task. So if you, was, you could have said uh, for video decoding or encoding, because that's what a graphics card would be used for. If you do Photoshop, because Photoshop does loads of, like, highly mathematical effects... Photoshop will actually run and make use of your graphics card. If you've got the latest Photoshop. Okay. So that is the sort of question that we've got to work on, guys, that one. Right, the binary question. I'll go through this. Um, a couple of people have asked me about this already. We did ask the same question of the year nines which was an interesting how you did it. Right, so this was, add these two numbers together. Oh, I'm not reading this very well. Oh, oh, one, oh. Right, so we're going to add them together. And I'm going to give you a tip. And I have mentioned this when we've done this before. Okay, here's the tip. If you get a carry at the end, identify it as such. Because the answer, you do not want to mix it up with it. Okay? Right. So we do the normal, add the two numbers together. So, not and not, one and one is not carry one. Not one and one is not carry one. Uh, not carry one. And they've done it on purpose so that you keep like rolling the carry. So that was so annoying. I went through the question like three times. <laughs> Oh, what, because you thought you got it wrong? Yeah. <laughs> no, carry one. Uh, no, carry one. No, wait to do A level and we do two's complement and you'll, you'll get really annoyed. Right, again. No, carry one. 
Okay? Oh, I'll jump, I'll jump to a bit there. Right. When we add these two together, we get 0, carry 1. Right, we've run out of bits. So we put the carry, remember that's part of the CPU. There is a special bit in the status register of the CPU called the carry. So what my recommendation for you is when you do a question like this, arithmetic, and you end up with something in the carry, a 1, not doesn't matter, but if you end up with a 1 in the carry, put a box around it, because we've now got 9 bits. Label it up as carry, so you're saying to the examiner, you're saying, you know what, I know exactly what's going on here, I know what you can ask me next as well without even looking at the next question, because you've done it on purpose. The answer is the 8 bits. This is your answer. If you did this, so this would be the perfect way to lay it out. So you're showing the 8 bits that the computer got as a result was 0, so the answer is 0. But the next part of the question said, what's happened? Well, it's overflow. It's flowed over. It's literally flowed over. We need more bits. A lot of people um, tried to explain that as well. Said, like, oh, we've got 9 bits, but we can only hold 8, which is brilliant. Okay, because that's exactly what the state of overflow is. If it was two four-bit numbers, and they asked you to add them together, you'd do the same thing. You'd say, right, in four bits, that's the answer, but there may be an extra bit, and that's the carry. If you didn't do that, so, and this is what a few people did, I was a bit fair when I marked this, to be fair. I went, oh, you've got the, yeah, yeah, you've got the answer. If you'd done that, and you've got that as your answer, Look at how many bits you had to start with, okay? And I would do something, I'd either, some of you did this, copy it out again, and some people did this, and say, right, well, actually, that's my answer, okay? But I know I've got this extra bit. But my answer is in eight bits. You've got to go off the question with that. If they say your computer is adding two eight-bit numbers, I can't remember what it said now. Did it give any detail? Oh, it did say eight bit, didn't it? So there was specific in the question about 8 bits. So if you ever see that, it says 4 bit. You're restricting it to 4, anything else is the carry. There's only we want extra bit. Because you're only adding pairs. Okay? But it was nice that even people who stuffed up the first bit of the question managed to say it was overflow. So you're not completely dense. Okay? Right, the next one. Oh, this annoyed me, this one. Right, hexadecimal. Hexadecimal is the gift question that keeps on giving. Remember, hexadecimal, the relationship between binary and hexadecimal. Four bits represents one hexadecimal digit. And the reason, remember, is because with four bits you can represent the numbers 0 to 15, which is exactly what hexadecimal represents. So all you had to do, the first one was 1001. Zero, zero, one. So that's one, two, four, eight. In fact, you don't even need to write the column headings down, do you? For that, for four bits, you know that, eight. So that's nine, so hex nine. Everyone got that one right. Then it started getting a little bit leery, okay? So we have this, the next one. Oops. Oh, no. When these pens work, you cannot rub them out with your finger. It's only when they're rubbish that you can rub them out with your finger. Right, then we have that one. So the answer is obviously 6, according to quite a few people in the class. No, it's 7. It can't be 6, it's odd. Isn't it? Right, and then I'll show you the bizarre answers. There wasn't just one person did this. So that was 7. Uh, the next one was this. Right. That's obviously 8 and 2. 10, it's 11. So, in hexadecimal, that obviously must be 11. Loads of people put 11. And you said, what are you doing? That's not hex, that's B. Some people guessed and said, that oh, must be A. Who put 11? So you got, the, the thing is that you got the right answer, you just didn't write it in the right format. Okay, right. Always be careful with the old hex questions. Really? Always be careful with the hex questions. They're easy. Super easy. So you, you don't want to be throwing marks away there. The problem is they're on the easy end. 
The paper has got to have so many easy questions. So yeah, there will be questions where you go, is that it? Is that all I've got to do? Yes. Because that's for the people who are going to get a four. Oh. They have a graduated set. So some of the questions there are only expecting people who are going to get a nine to do. So don't feel disheartened if you get a question and say, that is ridiculously hard. Yeah, it's supposed to be. They have to put a graduated set of questions. So there will be gifty questions on there. Um, right, the next bit. Oh, God, this was a question and a half, this one. Right, so we have to write down 3E in decimal. Right, you can write them down directly. You don't have a calculator in the exam. Okay? So, one way you could do it is to say, oh, this is hexadecimal. I could do column headings for hexadecimal, which go up in 16s. So, you could say 1, 16. If you do that, that's fine. It works with little numbers because even I can multiply 3 by 16 and get 48. So, you could do it this way, and then that is 14, and that's the units column, so that's just 14. So, the answer was 62. So you've got a map showing you working, but I advise you not to do it that way. You haven't got a calculator. If these numbers start getting nasty, 13 times 16, anyone? In your head? No, I don't think so. If you can do that, that's fine, but there was a lot of evidence. There was a lot of evidence from that question that you can't. This is how I do it. That is quick to write in binary. So let's write it in binary. So it's 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 0. You got a mark for doing that. And loads of people stopped. Loads of people did that. And I thought, yes, yes, you've done it. And then it's like, hang on, where's the, where's the last bit? The question does say, into a decimal number. Notice, that's an interesting thing. Notice that says decimal, not deanery. They're the same thing, the, the exam board like that. One minute they'll say Dean, and next minute they'll say decimal. Right, that was stage one. Then converted to decimal. So we've got a 32, a 16, an 8, a 4, and a 2. It's an even number, so those people who got an odd number didn't do the sanity check of just checking is it odd or even. Right, adding those up, Tetris numbers, 32 and 8 is 40. 16 and 4 is 20, so 40 and 20 is 60, plus 2. Okay. <laughs> right, and the last couple of questions. Right, sound sampling. You need to make sure that in your notes you have got some really solid info on this and the image stuff. Okay, which is something we need to work on in the next couple of lessons. Right, sound. Sound, a, we see as a way. <laughs> Bless you. Something like that. Okay. Sound is an analog thing, an analog signal. There is an infinite amount of variation between the highest amplitude and the lowest amplitude. An infinite amount. Computers can't do infinite. Think of this like temperature. So I say, what temperature is it? You might say, oh, it's um, in here. You might say, blimey, it's about 23 degrees or something like that. But you could be more accurate. You could say 23.4. Or you could be more accurate and say 23.47. Or 23.478. 9, 2, 1. And keep going. Okay? Because there is an infinite array just between 24 degrees C and 23 degrees C, temperature's analog. There is an infinite number of values. Because that's maths for you. Numbers. There's an infinite number of values between 23 and 24. So in order, in order to actually 
get something into a computer and process it, we have to take approximations, samples. Okay, so we have to say, oh, we've got a device that's this accurate and can measure the temperature this accuracy. With sound, what we've got to do is we've got to say, right, at any particular point in time, what is the amplitude of this wave? And we sample it, we say, oh, it's that value. And generally, when we sample, we have a fixed period. The sample rate. Okay? And we say, okay, let's take, at the same period, let's take a sample. Oh, not there, that's a bit stupid. Right. So we do that, we say, like, what's the value of this wave? What is it, positive or negative? These are the minus values. These are the positive. What is its value? And we record it. Okay? If we don't, and I'm going to talk about this in general, all right? If we don't sample fast enough or often enough, so if the sample rate is not high enough, we miss detail. So with a different colour, let me just show you what the computer would see this sound wave as if this was the sampling rate. You don't get any of the detail in between the samples. That's the key. So the sample rate affects how we perceive the sound. Oops, now we plant it. I will make a bite this the thought there. I'll put that, I'll put that back. Right, that's rough, okay? I, I didn't even know that from this point that the, the amplitude actually continued to go up. As far as the computer would be concerned, with this data, he goes, oh, it's gone down and down again. He doesn't realise it goes below that. That one's not too bad there. And, and that part of it there, that it's picked up quite well. This bit, rubbish, it's not seen this low amplitude there, and it's missed that off again, and it's missed that. He's gone, oh, it stayed level. No, it hasn't. It hasn't. We can see. Okay, same here. You've lost all this little bit of important information. That important information are sound frequencies. Okay, where that waveform changes, the amplitude changes rapidly, that's high frequency. High frequency changes in the amplitude generates different noises. So if we played that back, we'd miss sounds. Okay. If we increase the sample rate, then we will pick up more of the detail. So the sample rate is part of it. So each one of these samples, we need to store this value. But there are an infinite range of values. So we have to make a decision. Uh, and we call this the bit depth or the number of bits per sample. So if we've got a whole byte, that means we can represent 255 different values. Okay? Uh, and you don't know this, but in a byte, there is a way of storing negative numbers that will give us values between these ranges. You'll learn about that if you do at all. So I can represent 127 positive values up to this maximum. Whatever those numbers represent doesn't matter. And minus 128 negative values using 8 bits. If I use 16 bits per sample, I can have this range. So you, you get a lot more. Minus 32768 and positive 32767. See if we get one extra negative. The way it works. It's to do with something called two's complement, if you're interested in looking it up. So if I use 16 bits per sample, I can represent this change in amplitude a lot more accurately than using 8 bits. But there's a knock-on. Every sample using 16 bits takes up two bytes. So if I have 1,000 samples per second, and I use one byte, that'll be 1,000 bytes. Yeah? If I use... Two bytes for every sample, that's going to be 2,000 bytes. A thousand samples per second is good enough for sound to pick up frequencies from 0 to 500 hertz. 
which isn't very many. If you were listening to music, it wouldn't be very good. Human speech generally has a range of not to about 4,000. So when we're sampling speech, we sample at 8,000 cycles per second. Just for human speech. In general, the rule is, I won't go into, the, into this in detail, if you're interested, look it up, it's doing something called aliasing. Okay? When you want a frequency, you say, right, what is the maximum frequency I want to be able to pick up when I do my sampling? Double it when you do sample rate. So if I want to pick up 10,000 hertz, what would I make the sample rate? If I want to be able to hear the frequency 10,000, yeah, 20,000, just double it. Mobile phones work on this principle because they're designed to work with speech. So they'll sample at 8,000 hertz, which is why when you're listening to music over a mobile phone, when you're on like a waiting on a call centre thing, it sounds absolutely horrible. Like someone's playing it through a cardboard box that a frog has just eaten. And it's still inside the frog. That's what it sounds like to me anyway. Okay? So, but that's because all the sampling data, they've had to sample that music to play it. They've had to sample it at the sample rate of the phone signal. That's useless. Really useless. So very high-pitched voices don't come across well on the phone. At all. If, if, if you're speaking, so you're speaking, really? Is it somebody's voice? You might not even hear them properly on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you probably know people like that. Right, so if we increase the sample rate, so we take more samples per second, we'll get a better pick up, more accurate representation of the frequencies that are in the signal. If we increase the bit depth or the number of bits per sample, we'll be able to represent the changes in the amplitude more accurately. Okay, so there's a trade-off on space. So how how often do you sample? How big can the file be? When we do audio, CD quality audio, we sample at this rate, 44 kilohertz, because the biggest frequency that humans can generally, and it's only an average, people can hear better than this, is bizarrely that weird number. That's the highest standard frequency that the average person can hear, 22,000 hertz, okay, which is quite high pitched whiny, sounds like you lot when you're moaning, that sort of whine, yeah. okay, um, right, so with CD quality sound, that's how many samples you take per second, but we do it at 16 bits per sample, right, it is going to take up a lot of space, so we're saying that when we sample at that quality, we're going to use that many bytes for every second of the sound that we're recording. So nearly 100k per second. But generally we sample things in stereo. So we've got twice that. So you've got that in stereo. Uh, bites, right. bites. If you've got Dolby Surround 7 channel music, you've got 7 channels of it. But some of that is bass sounds, so you're not going to have to have the sampling rate as high for the bass. Ooh, that'll save you a bit. Um, if you've got quadraphonic sound, which used to be a real big thing in the 70s, it's coming back though. Coming back, people are releasing quadraphonic albums. Then you've got four channels. So every channel that you're going to record, that's going to add to your file size. So you do sometimes play about with this. So you got like, I'll sacrifice a bit of quality to make the files smaller. If you ever want to look at a raw WAV files, we call them WAV files, um, about three and a half minutes of music is about 50 megabytes. If you start using compression techniques like MP3, which is rubbish, uh, real poor quality sound MP3, 
But if you use that, there are better ones, like AAC and stuff. But MP3 will squish that down to about three and a half meg. So it'll knock, knock it down to 90% of its original size by throwing away data, which is why it doesn't sound as good. Okay, but that's sound sampling. So sample rate affects the frequencies that you can pick up. Bits per sample, how accurately you can represent the sound level, the amplitude. If you start increasing the sample rate, obviously you make the file bigger. If you increase the bits per sample, you make the file bigger. So you have to have a balance. Depends what you want the application to be. Okay. Right, final question. Oh, this crazy one about bitmaps. Right, bitmaps, it's all about technical words. Yeah, there's two bits. They're all about the image stuff, aren't they? Right. If you're talking about bitmaps, you have got to talk about pixels. The picture elements. Pixels. The pixels are what make the image. The pixels are coloured by the computer, the program, that is showing a bitmap. So you must mention that word, pixel. Picture element is all it stands for. Okay. Now, the colours that we can represent depend on the colour palette. Now, this question had uh, six different colours in its palette. And they, they asked you to say, using this as an example, and a lot of people got distracted by the letters. They started going about letters and things. Um, <coughs> That was just for your examples. So they didn't have to write white, blue, red in all those boxes because it couldn't fit it. That's why they did that. Right, so it uses a palette of six. Now we need to store that as a binary number. So if we've got six values, the binary for that would be not, not one, two, three, four, five, and six. How many bits do we need to represent six colours? No! How many is in that? Three. three! So, for each pixel, we need three bits. So the bit depth is three bits per pixel. This is the sort of technical language you've got to use. But that's how you work it out. If they say there's six, if they say there's 37 colours, write down the number 37 and work out how many bits it is. Yeah, there is. Why is there seven numbers on the board? I've got seven numbers. What number? So I've said there were six colours. I've got seven down. Zero is a number, isn't it? So I can use zero to represent one of those colours. It still doesn't change. It still needs three bits. But be careful of that. Did it on purpose. Good that you spotted it. Never forget that zero is one of the values you can represent on the computer. Yes? I just use one. No, you never waste a, a representation. If I gave you eight colours and you went, oh, well, eight is that, you'd use four bits, but actually with eight colours you could use three bits. Which doesn't sound like much, but if you've got like a 10 megapixel image and you've just shaved off 10 million bits, it makes a difference to the size. Yeah, always do that. So that's no one, two, three, four, five, six things. Everything starts at no. No is a value. So you have to talk about that. That you were going to represent these pixels in the image using this. Someone gave me a brilliant explanation of a palette, and they said all of this stuff and talked about the palette, but they never ever mentioned the word pixel ever. They just talked about the palette, and it was fantastic. It was a cracking answer. If someone said, tell me about palettes in bitmap images, and they were going about the metadata, and, and that's fantastic. But the question was, know about the basic bitmaps. Okay, so you must talk about that. If you did talk about those things, about pixels made up of colours, arranged in this grid format, the palette says what numbers represent what colours. These are all given binary values, that's all they are. And then the computer looks those up when it's drawing it on screen. So, no, yeah, make that one pink, make that one red, make that one white. 
Some people started going on about compression, run length and coding. And again, some nice explanations of run length and coding, but that's not what the question was asking, unfortunately. And then the last bit, uh, reducing the number of colours. If we got this and we reduce it to four colours, that means, so if we just do that again, there's four colours, you can see that we don't need this bit anymore. So if we reduce the colours, we reduce the bits required per pixel. And what we call that is the bit depth of the picture. If we do that, we reduce the number of bits that we need to store in the overall file. So we will get savings. In fact, if you did that, you drop this down, just took two colours away. Obviously the image would look slightly different, but you would actually save a third. Wouldn't you? Because instead of using three bits, you're only using two. So you would drop the file size by a third. That's how you need to tackle these questions, guys. You need to use the technical language, but then explain what you mean. So don't dive in with an example. Always start with the technical thing you want to talk about, then give the example to illustrate what you mean. Always do it that way around. Right, I'll, I'll stop that there, but I'll upload that to YouTube. That was <laughs> 46 minutes. How